All right, welcome everyone. I'm Jenny Hocking. I'll be presenting to you today uh, and thank you to Moreland City Libraries for inviting me to speak about my book, The Palace Letters. I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Roy Wurrung people as the traditional custodians of the lands and the waterways in the area now known as Moorland. We pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations communities who contribute to the life of the area. I'm Professor Jenny Hocking, as, as I said, and uh, I'm very grateful to Moorland City Council and Heidi Babatsikos for inviting me to speak to you Today, I'm uh, an Emeritus Professor at Monash University, an award-winning biographer. I wrote a two-volume biography of Gough Whitlam, where many of the material I'm going to be talking about today first came to my attention. And uh, I've written, I think, eight other books uh, other than the one I'll be speaking about today, The Palace Letters. Uh, and in 2016, I commenced legal action against the um, National Archives of Australia seeking the release of what were then secret letters between the Queen and the Governor-General at the time of Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General's unprecedented dismissal of the twice-elected government of, of Gough Whitlam. It was a cataclysmic and many of you I'm sure would know volcanic episode in our political history and it's a time that's never really in my view, being fully understood, in part because the history was kept from us, uh, not only by the key individuals involved, but as we now know by the National Archives of Australia, which kept secret uh, under the embargo of the Queen, the letters between the Queen and Sir John Kerr, the Governor-General at the time of the dismissal. It's those letters, which are now called the Palace Letters, that I sought access to when I was working on Gough Whitlam's biography uh, more than a decade ago now and was unable to access. So uh, uh, the book that I'm going to be talking about today, which has just been published by Scribe, um, has, uh, uh, is really telling the story of what I, what I call a, it's a pay into the archives. It's a, it comes out of a great love of archival research, um, research which led into uh, a, a historic court case. It, it, it's a very unusual story. It was a four-year court case um, which ended up in the High Court of Australia and earlier this year, in, in May this year, we had a resounding win at the High Court and I have to say that 6-1 decision was emphatic um, and it overturned what effectively is decades of royal secrecy in Australia and to some extent centuries of royal secrecy um, in, in, in uh, England itself, where um, a royal uh, letters between governors general and the, and the monarch or the monarch and prime ministers are routinely kept locked away in the royal archives and you simply cannot see them. So this book is a very unusual book because it takes us through what I see and has been described as a political thriller and uh, a courtroom drama all, all combined. So I've been delighted with that reception because it's certainly what I set out to achieve. It, it, to me, it was a thrilling story, an unusual story, um, and it's one which has had a resounding victory. And again, it's a sort of moment of colonial upstartery, I think, where we've said, no, the Queen's uh, control over our archives no longer holds, and we ought to be able to see these historic records, and it's a wonderful thing that we now can. Why were these letters so important and sufficiently important for me to take um, what became a four-year legal battle rather unexpectedly um, all the way to the High Court? Well, it's partly because of the significance of the obvious significance of the letters themselves. We know that Kerr was writing to the, to the Queen on a regular basis, that um, uh, other documents in his papers indicated that these were extremely critical in his thinking, in determining uh, uh, his decision on the 11th of November 1975, 45 years ago this year, to end um, without warning the government that had been re-elected only 18 months earlier, led by Gough Whitlam. 
Uh, it was an extraordinary decision. It was one in which, as Whitlam correctly later claimed, he was ambushed. Whitlam was anticipating holding a half Senate election and that was the reason he was at Government House that afternoon to finalise the paperwork with Kerr, which they had discussed earlier that morning. Now, when I began research initially into the biography of Whitlam, and that research has continued all the way through to this current book, The Palace Letters, it was abundantly clear that the story we'd been told about the dismissal at the time and in the years since was deeply flawed at best and uh, 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 in many ways distorted through omission. And the key omission was uh, uh, the revelation around the involvement of others. So John Kerr had always claimed that he acted alone, that this was a solo decision, that no one else was involved in, 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 in his thinking and his planning as he moved towards the dismissal. To my astonishment, when I worked through his papers, and I was the first person really to open his papers because they only became available to be opened in the archives in 2005, 2006, it was clear that he had extensive discussions with, with others. And the major one that was revealed when the biography was published was his engagement with Sir Anthony Mason, who was a High Court judge at the time and who met with Kerr in secret over many months. And as Kerr described it, was, got, was providing him with fortification for the action he was to take. Now, this is simply extraordinary. It was a profound breach of the separation of powers, but it was also a profound uh, revelation for history because it had never been revealed for 37 years. So it really opened my eyes to the fact that history can be kept secret. And I found that quite shocking because these key protagonists had determined that it would be kept secret. I uh, did interview Sir Anthony Mason. I asked him about this matter and he refused to speak about it. And he said the most startling words to me. I, I pleaded with him to speak to me on, on behalf of history, that we needed to know more about this event. And he said, I owe history nothing, which I found simply extraordinary. And of course, that is detailed in both the biography and this book, The Palace Letters. So it's been a process of, I think, unpacking the dismissal of the Whitlam government. And that's the larger project, a sort of historical corrective, if you like, which the palace letters then fed into, because so many of the materials that were available in Kerr's papers then became part of our legal action. They became the empirical backbone of, of, the, uh, of the court case. And for that reason also, it's a very unusual court case. Um, and I should say here that we all owe a great debt of gratitude to the legal team who took this action pro bono um, and worked for four years so hard on it. Um, Anthony Whitlam QC at the Federal Court, uh, Tom Brennan SC throughout, um, uh, Brett Walker SC at the appeal at the federal, full Federal Court and, and at the High Court, and we were instructed by cha Cause Chambers Westgarth. They were magnificent, they were dedicated, and they worked so closely with me to ensure that I was protected at every point um, when I was facing potentially a dire outcome at various stages. So it's it's been an extraordinary journey and the High Court outcome has been absolutely exceptional. Um, and uh, 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 the reason the letters were closed to us was because the National Archives had determined that they were personal. And as personal records, they did not come under the Archives Act. Now, the first thing that strikes you here is how could letters between the people at the apex of a constitutional monarchy, that is the Queen and the Governor General, who are representative in Australia, be in any way personal, much less when they are dealing with the most extraordinary constitutional and political crisis we faced in our history, that is the uh, blockage of supply by the opposition in the Senate, which led to ultimately Whitlam's dismissal. So we challenged that on the grounds that they were clearly not personal records. And that became a very, uh, a very interesting, dramatic story through the courts. And what I've done with this book is really work hard at making this a fascinating courtroom drama. And I'm delighted to say that many people have picked up on the fact that it is a courtroom drama combined with a political thriller. Um, and along the way, it's interspersed with other archival finds. I happen to really enjoy archives. I enjoy archival 
uh, uh, research. It's a great search of discovery. It unravels history. It challenges history. Um, and nowhere is that more important than for uh, contested histories. And one of the most contested histories uh, has been the history of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. So it's been extremely exciting and also uh, historically challenging to find so many pieces of information that have changed the way we've looked at the dismissal of the Whitlam government over the last decade in particular. And all of those materials from Kerr's papers, there's a diary in which he cites from these palace letters. There are extracts from seven of the palace letters, which I identified there. There are letters to others in which he quotes from these letters. It was clear that we could build up, if you like, a composite picture of what the palace letters were telling us before we even uh, put together our case at the federal court. And we were always very confident that our research base was particularly strong. And uh, and even two chapters of my previous book, The Dismissal Dossier, were included in our, in our um, evidence book that went up to the federal court. So in that sense, again, this case was unusual for bringing together uh, historical research as part of a legal case. And I must say, I found every step of that I suppose intellectual alchemy where it become, shifts from history and becomes law, I found that absolutely fascinating. And I should say that I'm very, very happy to take questions afterwards. I know there's always a lot of interest in this topic. It's still an evolving area. It's a dynamic history. It's a fascinating history. So please, at the end of my brief talk, uh, use your comments uh, section over there on the uh, comments uh, site and, and do ask me a question and I'll come to them uh, once I finish speaking, I'm very happy to speak um, to any of the questions that you may have. Um, so the, 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 the challenge for us was to show that the archives had mislabeled these, uh, these letters as personal. One of the great stumbling blocks, I think, legally for the archives was our realisation, which only came about because of the court case, that the letters were not closed by Kerr's wishes, which the archives had always told us that um, there was an embargo over their, their, um, their opening um, and that that had been placed there by Sir John Kerr. It was only once we saw documents from the National Archives during the court case that it became clear that in fact it was the Queen herself who had placed an embargo over our access to our own historical documents held in our own National Archives. And she had placed that uh, potentially permanent embargo uh, soon after Kerr's death, within three or four weeks of Kerr's death, they were changed, the terms of access were changed, and that was critical in our argument. How could these be personal if Sir John Kerr himself did not place the embargo over them? So we were faced with a situation where a slice of our history, a really critical slice of our history, was denied to us by an embargo set by the Queen. And this just seemed completely wrong that no independent nation could accept the fact that the Queen, tens of thousands of miles away, could be placing an embargo over material held in our national archives. They're not held in the Royal Archives, they're held in our own national archives. So again, this became a critical part of the legal case. Um, when the letters were uh, released following the High Court decision this year, this was an historic outcome. It's one that no other Commonwealth nation has achieved. And I do want to stress this, that the High Court's decision is extraordinarily significant. It's significant not just because it's a wonderful reflection of our status as an independent uh, nation uh, uh, challenging royal secrecy in this way, but because we are the first Commonwealth nation among the 15 that have exactly identical provisions of secrecy over royal correspondence that, uh, that our law must hold. And the High Court plurality judgment was quite explicit on this point, and I think it's a marvellous thing that it said very clearly that they are aware that this decision goes against the wishes of the Queen. They are aware that this decision goes against the expectations of Buckingham Palace and indeed our own government house, and said, however, Australian statute law, that is the Archives Act, must prevail. And you might think that in the year 2020, we don't need to hear those words, but apparently we do. And I think it's a magnificent decision for our history, but also for our legal autonomy, 
that we no longer have to pay lip service to the wishes of the Queen over this matter. And I find that quite a startling uh, element in the case, how much it became clear that we were being denied access simply because the palace wanted us to be denied access. And in fact, Buckingham Palace, uh, through the Queen's private secretary, made contributed to a submission at the federal court through Government House by sending letters stating that these letters should not come under our Archives Act, quite incorrectly, as it turned out, because our High Court ruled otherwise. And I thought again, what extraordinary imperial presumption that they might tell us what they think our Archives Act means and that we ought to be keeping these letters secret. So Buckingham Palace worked very hard to retain secrecy over these letters um, and were not happy at all when they had to be released by virtue of an order of the High Court of Australia. So the significance is not just because we've now seen these extraordinarily important letters. As a historian, this is a magnificent trove of letters and uh, the decision is wonderful for our history. Um, but beyond that, there's a really important legal precedent that's now been set. It's for others to take that into other jurisdictions, whether they're in Commonwealth jurisdictions or indeed here in Australia, where our states also, in my view, ought to now be looking at their correspondence with state governors over the decades and asking whether they too ought to now be open. You know, we've moved beyond this notion, I think, of still having fealty to the Queen or to a notion of the divine right of kings that can control aspects of our history. And that's something that has been really moved along by that decision. And it, it's, as I said, it's a wonderful thing. So um, the book uh, I set out to write, obviously, as I said, um, part political thriller, um, part courtroom drama. And I did think very long and hard about how to achieve that. I'm more than aware that it, it's a great difficulty often to make a courtroom drama actually work, to make it jump off the page. And one of the things I did was to reread the former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's book on the case that he took, the Spycatcher case, which is um, decade, a couple of decades earlier, but a very, very important case in Australia, allowing a book, the Spycatcher uh, trial, to be um, to be released. Uh, as Spycatcher was then released thanks to Turnbull's really extraordinary victory, um, uh, again over elements of UK secrecy law here in Australia. And he writes extremely well. Um, his book, The Spycatcher Trial, is, is, is a wonderful book to read. And I reread this and thought, well, how, how fitting it would be if Malcolm Turnbull wrote the foreword to my book, which, um, which is the great current challenge to royal secrecy. And I'm delighted to say that Malcolm Turnbull has contributed a marvellous foreword to the book. Um, it really uh, brings to life, I think, the, the key issues around royal secrecy um, but also the, the need to move to a republic and, of course, his view of what the palace letters tell us. And it's a fascinating part of the book and I couldn't be more delighted. So um, uh, uh, I, I, I thought about that use of a narrative and a first person narrative um, structure, which uh, uh, because many of you will be interested, I'm sure, in, in literature and books as as uh, people involved and connected to the Moreland City Libraries, which is a wonderful resource in itself. Um, I found that a real challenge. As an academic, of course, I'm far more used to writing in the third person about someone else. And, and there's a certain safety in that. There's, a, there's an assuredness where you can speak uh, for your biographical subject, as I have done three times now through three different biographies. Um, but of course, the author is always there in one way or another of necessity. It, it's the author's book and the author's interpretation. But to tell my own story in the first person where the first word in the book, I think, is I, I must admit that was challenging. But I, I came to really um, understand and enjoy that process because this was an essential part of the book. It is my story. It is an unusual story. It was a remarkable confluence of my historical research as a historian coming together with uh, great skill and interest of a committed group of, of lawyers who otherwise, you know, this wonderful opportunity could simply never have come about. So um, I, I wanted to make that a pacey story, one in which there was intrigue, there were so many obstacles along the way, there was a sense of, are we ever going to actually get there? Can I keep going? And so on. Um, and of course, the identities and the personalities involved. Um, including Sir John Kerr himself, who I think is an utterly tragic figure. Um, 
not only through the material I've looked at for many years, through his papers, he's a completely obsessive person about the dismissal, but of course through these terrible letters, as Malcolm Turnbull says in the strongest possible terms, that, that Kerr's letters, his obsequious deferential letters, are stomach churning. And I have to say they are. It's appalling to read Sir John Kerr, our Governor General, utterly um, uh, 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 deferential uh, letters seeking the approbation of, of the monarchy and, and, and wanting um, uh, to gain their, 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 uh, their agreement, their approval, needing their approval for even for how he writes his letters. I mean, it's nothing short of embarrassing to read them. He's come from the uh, New South Wales Supreme Court as, as Chief Justice to take up the position as Governor General, and yet he is in awe and in the thrall of the Queen's Private Secretary. It's, it's quite remarkable. The critical thing to remember about these letters, and there has been a lot written about the letters, and that's why I stress that my book is actually a very different book. It's a book that takes us to the release of the letters, but it is not an, a book that once again trawls through the entrails of the dismissal. I have done that book myself in a book called The Dismissal Dossier and to some extent in, in the Whitlam biography, the two volume biography. This is a book about an historic court case and it's about a historic court case that ends up with a historic outcome and that is the release of the Queen's personal correspondence that she sought and fought very hard not to have released. The critical thing in interpreting the letters is the central element, the defining feature of a constitutional monarchy. This is emblazoned on the Buckingham Palace website, so important is it, that, that the Queen as a constitutional monarch remains politically neutral at all times. These letters show that in this instance, that was not the case. The initial political nature of the letters is volunteered by Sir John Kerr. He begins with a letter that is clearly undermining the government of the day, the Whitlam government. He he cavils against decisions of the government. He questions actions of the government. He rails against the government to the Queen's private secretary. And again, as Malcolm Turnbull says very clearly, the most shocking thing about the letters is that the Queen's private secretary engages with him in that political um, uh, 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 discussion, negative political discussion of the Whitlam government. Kerr ought never to have raised these matters. Once he had, the Queen's private secretary ought never to have engaged with him on them. Where the letters are at their most personal, uh, their most uh, political, and in my view, at their most improper, is over the question of the reserve powers. That was, of course, the notion that both the Crown, the Queen, um, and Sir John Kerr as her representative retained what are called residual powers, residual powers to act unilaterally, to act on their own decision making, even if that meant acting against the government. The critical factor in 1975 that enabled Kerr to act was that he took the view that the reserve powers existed and that he could act on them against the government in secret without warning. Now, these letters show quite shockingly that he raised that question with the Queen's private secretary. And he did that in October in a letter in which he indicates that he is waiting for the advice, the formal advice of the government's att attorney general, but also the solicitor general, who is his formal legal advisor. And he's expecting that they will tell him that the reserve powers do not exist, or if they do, that they are not applicable at that instance. And that is in fact what his formal advice from government is. At that time, there was a great contention over the reserve powers. It was largely thought that, you know, with the advent of proper parliamentary government and proper parliamentary democratic processes, that that notion no longer held, that that was from a bygone era, from a monarchical era, uh, and no longer held any sway when responsible government obviously meant that the governor general must act on the advice of his elected government. That's what democracy would, would entail. These two things are in co conflict, the notion of democratic government together with responsible government and the notion of a residual reserve powers. And it was largely thought by many 
that the reserve powers did not exist. Gough Whitlam believed they did not exist at that and were not relevant at that stage. The Attorney General kept in to be advised Kerr of the same, and the Solicitor General advised him that there was no basis for the use of the reserve powers if they did exist, simply because the, the opposition was refusing to vote on the supply bills. That's critical because the Queen's Private Secretary, Sir Martin Charteris, replies to Kerr to that letter and says in no uncertain terms, the reserve powers do exist, that you have the power is known. Now, I ask the question, to whom was this known? It was not known to the government of the day because they had advised him otherwise. It was known to the palace. This was the palace's view. And yet without that view of the reserve powers, Kerr could not have acted. Uh, uh, and there are some critical letters, the very last letters from Sir Martin Charters on the 4th and 5th of November before Kerr did act, which raise very significant uh, questions about the involvement of the palace in advising Kerr in a matter uh, that he then clearly acted upon and, and removed uh, the government, the elected government of the day. So uh, some critical questions that are very concerning um, for the role of the palace in a constitutional monarchy. They ought not to have been having these discussions with Kerr. And there's no doubt, again, as Turnbull said, that Kerr saw this as encouragement um, from Sir Martin Charteris to use the reserve powers as, as he did. Um, so the, the letters for me raise some really fundamental questions. We ought not to be in a position as an independent and autonomous nation where our Governor General can take action in secret from the government uh, following extensive political discussions um, with uh, the Queen's private secretary. I just want to say a couple of other things before we move to questions, and please do put your questions in um, through the comments um, uh, uh, box, and I'll happily go through them. And that is that we now know, and as I certainly revealed in the um, biography of Whitlam, that uh, both Lord Mountbatten and Prince Charles were highly supportive of Kerr's action. Mountbatten, in fact, who was, of course, Prince Philip's um, uncle and the Queen's favourite, I think, second cousin, they're all very interrelated as they are in the monarchy, um, uh, was extremely um, uh, complimentary to Kerr. Within weeks of the dismissal, he had sent a letter praising his correct and courageous action, sent him his strongest, greatest admiration, and visited Australia some months later where he paid a visit to Kerr uh, and again to praise him in person and congratulate him on his courageous action in sacking the government. Now, it's been revealed because of the High Court uh, success. Uh, other letters have since been revealed from the royal family and Prince Charles also wrote to um, Kerr just months after the dismissal, praising him uh, in very similar wording to Lord Mountbatten. Um, such similar wording about his courageous and correct action that it does in fact make one wonder if this is a palace view and a, a something that has been discussed. And certainly Kerr wrote to, to Sir Garfield Barwick, the, the then Chief Justice of the High Court, saying uh, that he had received Mountbatten's letter and that he had no doubt um, that Mountbatten's view was shared by others in the palace and that he believed that from the letters that had been sent to him after the dismissal. So that's another very important, I think, indicator that there was no uh, great concern, not initially anyway, on the part of the palace for the action that Kerr had taken. The other final thing I'll, I'll end on tonight um, before we move to questions is the role of the National Archives. Many people have asked me, why was the archives so intent on preventing our access to these letters? And what the archives had always told me was that these were uh, under an embargo that had been placed on them by Kerr. Uh, and it was only subsequently that, that it was revealed that in fact this had been placed on them by the Queen and that uh, this was placed over Kerr's let letters after Kerr had himself died. And there's a real question about the priorities of the National Archives, which is their task with pr pr protecting and uh, making available critical documents in our history that they retain for that purpose. Of particular concern is the expense that the archives has gone to. It has uh, came out in Senate estimates that it has spent over a million dollars on its own legal fees in contesting the case all the way to the High Court of Australia. Uh, 
But of course, in losing the case, uh, it then had costs awarded against it all the way back to the federal court, which meant it had to pay all of my legal costs. So the National Archives has now spent close to $2 million contesting this case. And at a time of reducing budgets, reducing staff, it's lost 25% of its staff in the last decade, at a time when its records are in danger of being damaged through a lack of digitisation, and they've acknowledged that, that they have really un un unparalleled holdings on audiovisual holdings, including of Indigenous languages, rare Indigenous language tapes that will not otherwise survive if they're not transferred to, um, to digital form. And yet they claim they do not have sufficient funds to make that protective action, and they've spent $2 million contesting this case. I find that very troubling, and many people have raised significant concerns about that decision of the archives. Um, and the final point I'll make before I take questions is that one other quite shocking element that I think points to the way in which our history has been profoundly distorted in the interests of protecting the, these, our knowledge of these letters is that another set of letters which became, uh, uh, which I came across in the archives, which also formed a part of our, of my writing of the palace letters, is that the year after he left uh, office early as Governor General in 1977, the following year, 1978, Kerr was working on his autobiography. He wanted to reveal what he called the truth of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. Now, you can imagine perhaps this, this sent great nervous shockwaves <laughs> all the way to Buckingham Palace. This extraordinary set of letters, quite apart from the palace letters, which I had access to about 18 months, two years ago, show that the palace, the Queen's private secretary, wrote to Kerr in 1978 and asked to see his book. They wanted to see an advanced copy of the book before it was published. And effectively, they wanted the book to be vetted. The letters show that they wanted any reference to the exchanges between the Governor General and the Queen's Private Secretary at the time of the dismissal to be omitted from his book. And Kerr writes to the Queen and says he's, uh, he's made very certain that there is no mention of these exchanges with Sir Martin Charters, her Private Secretary, at the time of the dismissal. And the reply is that they are very grateful that he's done so. So they are completely omitted from his book. It is again a distortion of history through omission and that is a, what I've called a royally vetted uh, 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 book uh, from Sir John Kerr. And that's, again, startling. So not only do we see the involvement of the palace in uh, Kerr's thinking and his, his, his prior discussions before he dismissed Whitlam, but we also see the involvement of the palace in making sure that he did not mention these discussions in his memoir. And then 45 years later, we are faced with an embargo of the Queen to prevent us and our history knowing this. Um, so all of this is, is revealed and discussed, and thrillingly so, uh, in this wonderful book, The Palace Letters, which I do hope that you are able to buy and that you enjoy. Uh, the feedback to me has been that the political thriller and courtroom element uh, is, 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 is certainly works and uh, has been successful on that level and I couldn't be more delighted. And of course, it takes us into what the letters tell us and how they change our understanding of the dismissal of the Whitlam government. That's, a, that's an extraordinary history in itself. It's a history that's evolving. And I've got no doubt that it will continue to evolve and that more materials will, will come out about it because uh, deception was at the heart of the dismissal, deception of the prime minister, deception of the government. Um, and, 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 and deception of our history since. And no doubt other materials will continue to be released and we'll, we'll have that shifting process in the history of the dismissal, which is such a fascinating one. So thank you all for listening. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope you have many questions because I'm certainly here to take them. So, so please ask, uh, ask away by typing into the comment, the comment zone Otherwise, I'll, I'll be signing off. So, <laughs> so please do ask your questions. All right, if there's no questions and I can't see any questions popping up there,
I'll say thank you very much and thank you for having me, um, Moreland City Libraries, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Thank you.